Thank you so much for being here uh, and giving me this chance to mention some of my ideas and to goad you into thinking or rethinking yours. Um, to do this, I ask you to share two assumptions with me. First, that unless you're a hermit and you're not because you're here, you're at least bicultural. Right? And second, that you can't fully understand a culture until you understand its sense of humor. So if you don't have one, pretend. <laughs> <laughs> okay. To take these assumptions seriously, you have to describe before you prescribe. Uh, too often we make our judgments and then decide, uh, or never even see what it is that we've decided about. So describing before we prescribe means we have to figure out what the facts are. So I'm going to describe my immigration to America and then my emigration from banana hood. Yellow on the outside, black on the inside, or white on the inside, depending on how you uh, make your uh, banana. Remember the stuff we used to do with Girl Scouts and the chocolate and stuff? All right. Anyway, <laughs> I was the only Asian in Teaneck, New Jersey, where I grew up in the 50s. Uh, so think about your own comings and goings, your immigrations and your emigrations into and out of families, neighborhoods, schools, jobs, countries, religions, moods, gangs, whatever. And keep in mind that the facts may be hard, but your brain doesn't have to be. I was born in China in 1942. In 1946, my parents, older sister Betty and I arrived in Brooklyn, Brooklyn Dodgers. One day later, Betty and I were enrolled in public school number eight. I spoke no English. Betty could say, Lucky Strike and shut up. <laughs> the principal let her skip two grades and made me do kindergarten twice. So much for ESL in those days. In 1949, I started to think in English and to forget in Chinese. In 1960, I went to college, where I majored in history, government, and screaming. The screaming didn't get me the lead role in the diary of Anne Frank because the director didn't think that a Chinese could play a Jew from Amsterdam. But it did get me on the Tufts cheerleading squad. And from there, onto a full page of Sports Illustrated, clothed. <laughs> Somebody realized this was the year of art, and they hadn't done anything. So they had to do something. So they invited about 50 people across the country, including my husband, to be part of the first White House collection. So I said to my husband, I said, OK, we're going to the White House. You're going to have to wear a suit. He goes, no, I'm not going to wear a suit. I don't care where I'm going. I said, no, no, no. <laughs> not going to do this artist thing. You're going to go wear a suit. Right? <laughs> Two days later, he comes up to my office. He says, I just rode away for a suit. I said, what do you mean you rode away for a suit? <laughs> you mean like L.L. Bean? You mail ordering a suit to go to the White House? He goes, no, no, no. I just, I just wrote to Donna Karen. Dear Miss DKNY, uh, I've been invited to the White House and I have nothing to wear. I think you make beautiful clothes, I make beautiful pots. You want to swap? <laughs> Two days later, she calls and she said, I'd love to swap. So then it ended up in a $1,800 suit. And we went to the White House and we had our picture taken. And so I was able to have a picture in red leather framed that I could present to my honorable mother. Look at the picture. She doesn't even notice the suit because he's wearing a turtleneck anyway. And of course, you can't even see the sandals and pink socks. <laughs> but all she could do was look at Hillary Rodham Clinton and point to what was around her neck. And she said, what is that? And I said, well, they were blinking Christmas tree lights. <laughs> <laughs> And my mother said, I cannot believe our First Lady showed up in public with blinking Christmas tree lights around her neck. Now, this was 1993. We had been in this country since 1946. That was the first time my mother ever referred to anybody in the White House as our. Okay. So you may have been here a long time or wherever you have been or gone to. It may take a while, however, for it to all sink in. So I started to talk about what it takes to Americanize. Let us act more like an immigrant rather than less. You have to be alert, you have to watch, and you don't just judge. You figure out what in the world is going on first. And so I like people to look at the ordinary events, such as dining, 
hence chopsticks, fork, and see what's going on that reflects the culture, whether it's bathroom etiquette, first day at school, birthday parties, or in this case, dining. Traditional cultures may require more time than modern life can allow. Finish up. We'd always marked William's birthdays with presents and sometimes a special dinner, but certainly I hadn't been so foolish as to invite pre-adults en masse into the house. <laughs> we hadn't spent decades renovating the house only to have it destroyed in two hours. So William knew about celebrating his birthday, he just didn't know that most of the American population regarded having the celebrant's friends, as in children, to be a necessary component at such occasions, until his friend, Eric, talked his mother into having a birthday party. Walking to Eric's house, careening with hyperglycemic little people, festooned with balloons and presents and streamers, I could tell right away that William thought this was a good thing. One look at Frankie, Eric's mother, and I knew otherwise. I found her in the bedroom, trying to become one with the corner wall. Had she been a cartoon, her eyes would have drawn in spirals and there would have been lots of parentheses around her head. Kathy, what am I going to do? Have you seen what it's like out there? I said, well, yes, it's impressive. Don't worry, we'll do this together. You do food, I'll do children. We did it. It happened in some kind of time warp, when a minute equaled a day, but we did it. After the last one left, Frankie would have, and I would have smiled to each other had we the strength. Standing by the door to see us out, Eric, momentarily still, politely thanked us for attending his party. I wished him a wonderful year. Thank you, Mrs. B. Isn't it great? Now that I'm five, I don't have to take a nap anymore. I didn't know William could do a double take. He did. <laughs> what did you say, Eric? <laughs> Covering up his ears, I pulled his head out the door just as Eric repeated himself. <laughs> I was too late. In the car, William asked, Mama, what did Eric mean about five-year-olds not having to take naps? William, some people think that as children grow older, they don't need naps. Mama, I'm five. Can I stop taking naps? No, William, we're Chinese. <laughs> because you're five, you can stop taking two naps. A sigh, and then a deep breath. Mama, when I'm six, I knew what was coming. Yes, William? When I'm six, can I have a birthday party with children? William, we're Chinese. <laughs> we don't start getting personal birthday parties until we're 60. <laughs> well, we begin a whole new cycle. Until then, we all grow one year older together at the Chinese New Year. When will I be 60? In the year 2034. Oh. All right, William. Since we're also Americans, how about a compromise? What kind? How? You were born in the year of the wood tiger. Chinese like to refer to the animal year they're born in. It's special because it only happens every 12 years. Not as special as the 60th, but special. So maybe we can do something special in 1986 when you're 12. It'll be a fire tiger year, but I'm willing to compromise if you are. Trying to figure out how long that would take when you got lost between the right thumb and the left index finger. Holding up seven of my own, I said, then you can have a birthday party at home with children. Okay? Although there still seemed to be entirely too many, it was still less than two full hands worth and a lot less than 60. Okay, Mama. Contract. And he waited patiently for that 12th birthday party. Good, because I think it'll take me between now and then to work up to the idea. He looked worried, wondering if this was a caveat. He knew all about contracts by then. A way out for me at the last minute. He knew that I taught logic. He didn't know exactly what that meant, except to listen very, very carefully to my choice of words. His 12th and 24th birthday parties were the hottest tickets in town. So listen carefully to each other as well as to your several selves. And when you have to choose, try to pick one that will close the fewest cultural doors, remembering that good laughter will often keep the doors from closing tightly.